presence, to have you experience your presence, Lord, that you were with us every day. And Lord, we just pray your blessing to be upon this time this morning. Lord, just let your, let your Holy Spirit just flow in and through us today and touch us and encourage us and give us life and those that are watching on, uh, on the video. Lord, we just pray you just touch them wherever they are, whatever place in the world they are, whatever what time it is they're watching. Lord, we just pray you just touch them. Lord, this is a time for the move and the power of your Holy Spirit to take place. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah, everybody. You may be seated. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. What a good looking crew out there. <laughs> uh, does anybody know what tomorrow is? Labor Day. Does anybody know what tomorrow evening is? Rosh Hashanah. We got a champion back there. Woo! Well, we're going to talk about Rosh Hashanah this morning. The Feast, the feast of Trumpets, God's wake-up call. I think we need a wake-up call, don't we? My, my video guy is right there. There it is. Hallelujah. We're getting on track now. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's God's wake-up call. Uh, Probably 20 years ago or so, I began to, uh, I've always been kind of curious about my family genealogy, and, and uh, I know that my ancestors on the Keller side came to America in 1970, or 1776 as indentured bond servants, and so to, to see family history and family lineage and all that kind of stuff has kind of been fascinating. But the Lord began to impress upon me the importance of our spiritual heritage. And where did we come from? Where did the church originate? Uh, because back about 400 A.D., for the next several hundred years, uh, the church entered into a replacement theology. That the church replaced Israel because Israel was destroyed in 70 A.D. They were dispersed all over the nations, and there's never been a nation that's been totally destroyed ever come back. Never happened. So, you th the uh, people back at that time begin to uh, come up with the replacement. Then the church is the replacement for Israel, and till 1867. And God began to move in that jubilee year and began the process of restoring Israel to where it is today. We worship uh, our Lord and Savior who is Jewish. All the disciples were Jewish. And all of the, the things that they taught us was from a Jewish perspective. I like listening to Shram uh, an Amir Sadati. He's a he's a messianic, um, messianic Jewish uh, man who was a former major in the military, and I like listening to him. What's going on over in the Middle East from a Jewish Christian perspective, and so it began a process in my life of learning about the cultures, the traditions, and the things that happen. And so much of what we, we see, uh, the feasts, well, those were Jewish things. Were they? Because God says, these are my appointments. In Leviticus 23.2, speaks to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. They're not Jewish feasts. They're God's feasts. And these, these feasts are appointments. Appointments that God says, I want to meet with you. Next slide there. Holy convocations. Convocations means dress rehearsals. Rehearsing what is going to come. 
So God wants us to meet with Him on these appointed times to remember what happened, but also to look forward to what is going to happen. What happened with, with Moses when he went up on Mount Sinai and he got the law, the Ten Commandments, all that stuff, and he came down and gave, us, gave the law. But he also gave uh, a covenant that was a sacrificial lamb. And so, thousands of years later, we can go back to what Moses was teaching and we can see that Jesus was that Passover lamb. It was with Moses. And so that appointment, we keep, don't we? Passover. Well, and we have changed the name to Easter. I call it, I like to call it Passover because Easter is not the original name. It's Passover. We observe Passover, the Passover where the Lamb was slain for us and we observe Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. There's a feast of first fruits and the feast of unleavened bread was all a part of those feasts. Now they're in very, very, very important feast that we celebrate is Pentecost. That was Pentecost, first Pentecost was when Moses came down off of Mount Sinai with the law. And he brought forth the, tab, the Ten Commandments. And <clears throat> Leviticus, all that was, was about the laws of God and that we have to, uh, the people had to observe. But what happened at Pentecost for us, the church? The church was born at Pentecost. A feast. And those feasts, and we look back at what has happened. But the fall feasts have not been fulfilled yet. And so that's what we're going to look at is, is tabernacle, or, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, which starts tomorrow evening. The trumpet blast. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that. But <clears throat> I just got to go. I just got to go. I can give you copies of my notes if you want. Uh, We look at God's calendar. God's calendar is based upon uh, seven years. The last, the seventh year of that calendar is called a Shemitah year. And that Shemitah year is the land was to rest. It was to rest for that year. You don't plant, you don't do anything, you rest. It's a year of rest. And God will provide for you. You prepare for that year and God will provide for that year. You rest. Israel, for 490 years, did not observe their Shemitah. They did not let the land rest. They went into captivity in Babylon. For how long? 442 years. Because there's still seven years. Seven years yet that has not been. That's the Daniel's 70th week. All based upon the Shemitah. Ah, shoot, I wasn't going to go down this, this but... It's, it's, it's very critical to where we are today. Because God's cycles are the same. They've been forever. But we, the church, have been ignorant of God's time clocks. God's moving in the hour that we're living in. In the World War II, was in a Shemitah cycle. Israel became a nation in 1948, the middle of a, uh, a Shemitah cycle, seven-year cycle, 1948. That Shemitah cycle ended in 1952. So that next cycle starts with the Feast of Trumpets, starts the year, and that year then, that first year, 
1952, we are at this year, the end of this year, this meet the cycle, which is next year of uh, tabernacles or trumpets next year will be the end of the, the, the 70th week. Everything that, that happens is based upon what God has established. It's not random. Let me, let me get into it a little more. Okay, I'm going to back up a little bit, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go more in depth in that in another, another week. I want you to understand what tabern- what, what hap- what's happening right now. At this feast, this appointment feast, this is appointment that God says, this is my feast. Tab- uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is mine. It's a dress rehearsal in preparation for the real thing that's coming. We are celebrating things that we're looking forward to the future, like Israel is looking forward to the future. What, what future are we looking forward to? Tabernacling with God for eternity in heaven. That's not happened yet. That's coming in the future. So this is an appointment to remember. It's a dress rehearsal and preparation for the real thing. Oh, and in John, the book of John, the Gospel, 660 of the 879 verses in that, the book of John all relate to things that happened around the feast. Feasts are very important. So the fall feast for the church as well, that's one of the Jewish things that's happened. And I believe that the church has missed, missed a blessing that we should be a part of because it's just as much for Israel as it is for us. Probably more for us. Because we are walking in covenant because we've accepted the blood of Christ. We've accepted the full atonement. So God's glory will be released because we will have such intimacy with Him. Walking in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not returning for a fractured, powerless bride. I have been saying this for a long time. That I've heard in the past, well, we're just going to tie a knot on the rope and we're going to hang on and pray that Jesus comes back tomorrow. Folks, I'm not hang, tying a, no, a rope on the, uh, knot on the rope. I'm believing that the bride is going to go out of here in full glory, full power, in the power of the Holy Spirit, because the church has raised up and become what she's supposed to be, an influence and a changer of the culture. We have to move from playing church to being the church. And stand up and begin to declare and decree. And not walk in fear. See, the Feast of Trumpets. This is excerpts from the Leviticus. On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of rest. A sacred assembly commemorated with the blast uh, the trumpet blast the 10th day of the 7th month of the of the day of atonement when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God on the 15th day of the 7th month the Lord feasts of tabernacles so what happens tomorrow night begins the trumpet blast we go into a progression of 10 days, the 10 days of awe. It's introspection, looking at ourselves, the Lord praying, spending time in the presence of the Lord. Is there any wicked way in me? Lord, is there anything you want me to do? We spend 10 days preparing. At the end of that time, it's the day of atonement. That is when the two sheep were brought in, or two goats were brought in to the, to the high priest, and the high priest, we'll talk about more of this and go to each one of these more deep, deeply, but the high priest, one was called the scapegoat and one was the sacrificial. He would lay his hands on the sacrificial and impart all the sins of Israel. And that one was slaughtered and the blood was put on the, holy, the most holy seat, the seat, the mercy seat, the tabernacle, or the, the box. Ark of the Covenant. The other one, 
He imparted all of the shame and the guilt of the people on the, on the, onto the goat, and it was sent off into the wilderness to die. What does this mean? My sins were atoned, never to be remembered against me no more. Yeah, well, that's what, that's what this feast was all about. That's for us, isn't it? Jesus was that sacrifice, and our sins are remembered against us no more. Shouldn't we be celebrating? And then right after that, we go into tabernacles. And the people, I believe we need to do it here, but in Israel, they would set up a tent, and for seven days, they would tabernacle with God. Spend time in the presence of God because in remembrance, you brought us out of captivity and you have set us free. Don't let us forget where we come from. How many Christians today do not remember where they come from? Well, I was saved back when I was a teenager. Do you celebrate when God saved you? We need to celebrate and remember God. If it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here today. I want a tabernacle. And tabernacle is a dress rehearsal for tabernacling with God for eternity. It's a dress rehearsal. We look at what has happened and we're looking forward to what is coming. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I keep getting ahead of myself here. I get excited about this because the church has not learned this stuff. And we're missing a tremendous blessing. Well, that's for them Jewish people. Well, folks, I have the blood of Jesus in me and that makes me a a Jewish person. We need to remember where we come from. The Feast of Trumpets is always called... Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. There's a confusion that can come with that because many of the uh, Jews believe that this feast was actually the creation of the world. And that was the beginning of the year, God's year for that, that year. God's year. But man fell. Man fell, God instituted another calendar, Passover, the redemptive calendar. So we have the, the ancient calendar of time, and we have the, the, the calendar of the redemptive calendar that t- takes place. <clears throat> and so, when you will... You will in reading in Scripture, there can be a confusion because you're reading about this, the Feast of Trumpets on the seventh month. That's the seventh month of the redemptive calendar. Not, and, but it's kind of been amazing to me that all banking institutions in the world, their, their year starts in September. Why is that? Because I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the ancient day of when time began. Just curious. So, the first cycle, the cycle of creation, the cycle of blessing. I know I'm probably totally off of this here. Redemptive Passover, provision, Pentecost. And the creation, the, crea- uh, the cycle of creation and the cycle of blessing. The blessing is the, the redemptive. Passover, Pentecost. So we celebrate <clears throat> redemption at Passover and provision at Pentecost. We are delivered from the hand of the enemy and receive a fresh God, uh, God's power and revelation. When the cycle of redemption is complete, a door is open to experience the blessing we have lost. The trumpet blast of Rosh Hashanah is the signal to shift out of the old cycle and enter into the presence of God. The seventh month of redemption becomes the first month of a new year of blessing. Seven days of creation, 
Seven is the last month. And so the seven, we just, I'm just kind of throwing things out here. The seventh month, what, happen, what happens after the seventh day? We start a new week. Seventh month, start a new year. I don't know, just throwing that out there. See, we're counting down to His presence. That's what we are looking for. Isn't it? When Jesus said, you see all these things coming upon the earth, look up, because why? Your redemption is drawing nigh. So that should be in all of our hearts is looking up for redemption. The redemption of Jesus that day. That we are, we are the bride of Christ. Wouldn't the bride, the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony, when he, when he comes, the, bride, the bridegroom comes, and he observes, I want her. So he sits down, and he begins to dialogue with her, and I would like you for my wife. And she then has an opportunity to accept or reject. So she accepts. Now they go to the, the father, and they, he gives the father the bride price, the price for her. And the father accepts. Now he goes for a period of time, upwards to one year, to prepare a place for his bride. You can see this throughout the Old Testament, exactly how this, this worked. And he cannot return until the father says, the room is ready. When he says it's ready, he comes back with his men he doesn't go all the way, but the trumpet blast sounds. The five wise virgins of five, the, they listen, they hear the trumpet blast. The groomsmen go in, pick her up and carry her back. They pick him up and carry them back to the hoopah, the marriage. And it's seven days. Seven days. I believe, and there's others out there, that we're not going to be here for the tribulation. Seven years of judgment upon the earth. God says, Jesus said that we are not meant for judgment. And it just is in a sequence of seven years of judgment on the earth, but seven years of the marriage supper of the Lamb and in heaven with God for seven years. At the end, what happens at the end of seven years? See, right now, we have to remember that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. So He is, he is not king yet. He's our intercessor, interceding for His bride. No, Lord, she's under my blood. Oh, He's under my blood, Lord. He's interceding for us. But when we're... He, Father says, now's the time. He comes back, takes us. Now we're bride and groom. The marriage supper, uh, the feast of seven days of consummation. Many believe that during that time is when we will be judged, not for our sins, but for our rewards. That's where we get our crowns. That's where we get uh, uh, the responsibilities that we'll have in eternity. I don't, I, we don't know what exactly will happen. But at the end of that time, when Jesus comes back, is the first time He's referred to as King. And He comes back with His Queen to set up His kingdom on the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. See, this is what we're looking for in tabernacles. Tabernacles is coming up as we're going to tabernacle with God. That's our hope. That's what we look forward to. So the Feast of Trumpets is the wake-up call. The Day of Atonement is the day of, of seeking Him. That's ten days of seeking the presence of God. Then there's the day, uh, uh, that's the days of awe. The Day of Atonement is the day of restoring to full fellowship. Recognition of the, the atonement that was made for us. And the Feast of Tabernacles, a week of experiencing His glory. So, <clears throat> We're living in a, a major countdown. 
I don't know if any of you have noticed lately, but it seems like this world is winding down. I believe it's because we are coming to the ends of, end of time. This world is not eternal. It's dying. Since the fall of man, this world has been dying. And everything in it is dying. I am dying. This is not the body that I was when I was 20 years old. So one day, you and I will put on immortality. If you've accepted Jesus into your heart and accepted the atonement that He has made for you, you have eternal life inside of you. And we're completing our course. What God has set us here is to fulfill a purpose and a time. The things that we are to maybe to share to one person or to encourage one person or to give life to somebody. Or we don't know what God has for each one of us, but each one of us have a mission. That's why we're here. Not for us, but for God. That God can use us. That we are His His hands extended to this dying world. That I don't walk in fear of dying. I walk in hope of my eternal life. I don't begrudge anybody that leaves this life and goes to eternity. Hallelujah. They're, 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 they're done. So as we enter into the, the Feast of Trumpets and the Trumpet Blast, we enter into ten days of awe. Here's five things for us to look at, or four things here. Number one, spend, spend the next week or two through this time praising Him and reading His Word. Praise the Lord. I don't know if some of you follow me on, on Facebook. I just posted the deal I got. The church in um, Afghanistan, they were on the phone talking to someone who was a missionary or had ministered to them. They were surrounded and there was nothing they could do. They knew they were going to die. And on the phone, everyone began to sing louder and louder and louder until they heard the gunshot and then it was totally quiet. Praise the Lord. They're home. They're home. They've put on immortality. Their race is over. I pray that it doesn't happen to us, but we don't know what's coming. But Lord, let my light shine in the midst of the darkness. No matter what the consequence is, let the light, your light inside of me, reflect into someone else's life. That, that someone would see you through me. Praise Him. And read his word, Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me when, with all of your heart. In James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he will not draw near to us. If you're discouraged, you're despair, you're struggling with what's going on, draw near to God. This is your time to draw in and draw from Him. Draw down from the Holy Spirit. Get encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Number two, let God reveal cycles in your life. Ask God to show me any cycles of destruction in my life. Anything that I have done, Lord, that has is, is brought a breach between you and me. Are you... Uh, are you trapped in reoccurring situations in your life? Debt, infirmities, loss, things that's going on, reoccurring. It seems to happen over and over again. 
Press into God. And show, ask Him to show you how to break that cycle. Do you find that your heart has grown cold? <coughs> you no longer feel a closeness to God. Sometimes in our driest times is when we've got to press in the hardest. When things are mounting up against us and we don't know if we're going to make it. I found it in those times is when I hear the Lord the clearest. If God shows you old cycles in your life, ask Him to sh- if, if God shows you old cycles in your life, ask Him to show you the strategy for the freedom. If God's going to reveal something to you, He's going to show you how to get out of it. He's not going to, this is your problem, deal with it. No, the Holy Spirit is going to be right there and He's going to help you walk through it. He's going to help you walk out of it. Number three, ask God to reveal any sin in your life. This is a time that we need to consecrate ourselves. Separate ourselves from the world and those things that that draw us back into the the realms of the flesh and those fleshly desires and worldly desires and stuff. All of us have blind spots, areas of sin that we are aware of. Those areas of sin hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. During the days of awe, ask the Lord to reveal hidden sins. When God reveals sin, He also gives you the grace to gain the victory over it. And number four, draw close to God. You draw close to someone by spending time with them. Draw close to the Lord by spending time with Him. Maybe for the next few weeks, maybe we need to cut back on our schedules and stuff and just spend some more time waiting on the Lord. Because when this happens, we get ready to move into the next day. The next day of atonement. The day of atonement is a day to put all of your sins under the blood of the Lamb. Everything the Lord reveals through this time of introspection is when we come to the days of Oz, remembrance, to remember that all of your sins are put under the blood. Never to be remembered against you no more. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I, will wipe, I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So the sound of the trumpet is designed to activate something in your spirit. We activate Hopefully our, our spirits every Sunday when we act, uh, blow the trumpet. But it's a time to activate, activate. So listening to this so far, I said, let's let go of the old forms of security. Everything that you've looked to, to for your security, let go of it. Now I'm not saying to go out and sell your retirement plan and all that. I've heard, in the, I know people in the past, this back in the 70s, God was coming, God's coming. They cashed out their 401k and they went out and they bought a boat. So it's like, uh, well, 70 years and we're still not there yet. So that's not, a, not what I'm talking about. Don't put your dependency on that. Be wise. My dependency is not on what I have in the bank. My dependency is on the Lord. Because what, with all of this stuff that's happening, what would happen, the way they've been creating money and this inflation and debt and all this kind of stuff, what if all the economic systems of this world would collapse? What would happen then? See, back during the Depression, the 1920s, the market collapsed, there was high suicide. People were throwing themselves out of buildings and all that stuff. It was, it was, why? Because their whole hope was in the dollar. If your hope is in the dollar, you're going to be, you're not going to make it. A hope is in Jesus. 
Because I'm looking for, this is my, my thing, I'm looking for, everything collapses. Everything in the world is in a panic. And the church is here. And we pray. And God fills our house with food. And we're giving food to all of our neighbors. Jesus give this to us. Jesus is this. And your house is the only house in the neighborhood that people can come over and get water. Because we believe that Jesus poured water out of a rock. Well, why not? Pray, Lord, on my faucet, I declare you will give us water. He said, didn't Jesus say don't take concern what you eat or drink or the clothes you wear? Does not the Father care much more for the birds of the air? If He takes care of them, how much more will He take care of you? That has to be our perspective. No matter what happens in this world, we will not be defeated because God's with us. And He will provide. It doesn't mean that we might go a little leaner. It might might not uh, be a bad idea. But He will sustain us. Why? Because the only reason why we're here is to minister the Gospel to people that need it. So don't be discouraged. Don't be in despair. Lord, we thank You. We thank You. And Lord, as we enter into this time, this season, Lord, this season of Rosh Hashanah, the trumpet blast. Lord, we declare right now by the glory of the Holy Spirit to move in Your people, Lord God. As we spend time in Your presence, Lord, prepare our hearts for the days that are ahead of us. Prepare our hearts, Lord God. Get our, help us get our perspectives right. Get our, our thoughts right. Get our intent right. Because it's You, Lord, and You alone that will sustain us. Lord, it is You that we will walk in victory. Lord, it is by You that we will walk on water. Lord, it's by You that we will be translated one, one, from one place to another. Lord, we thank You, Lord Jesus, that You are moving. Lord, that we see the power. We see the power and the glory of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Our forefathers, the early church, Lord God, moved in power, moved in might. Lord, and they, were, they did not love their lives to the end, Lord, but they were willing to sacrifice it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that same anointing that was on the book of Acts, Lord, we're the book of Acts 2. Right now, in this hour, Lord, I pray an anointing upon Your people Everyone that's here and everyone that's watching, Lord, I pray the anointing would pour upon us, Lord God. As we spend time in Your presence, we spend time with You, Lord God. Lord, I pray that You would lead us. You would guide us, Lord, into the depths that You have for us. We thank You, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I am pouring out my spirit in this hour. I am pouring out upon you. For I love you with an everlasting love. I hold you in the palm of my hand and no one will take you from me. I ask you to depend upon me. Look to me for the source of your life. Look to me. Look to me and I will lead you and guide you every day. For I love you. I love you. You are mine and mine alone. 
and I will protect you, and I will watch over you, and I will be with you. Do not be afraid. Do not walk in fear. Walk in the confidence and the boldness that I want to pour out in you. The boldness that come upon my early church. Lord, the, 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 the same boldness will come upon this church, this hour, and in this time. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Wake us up, Lord. Wake us up, Lord. Wake us up, Lord. Wake up the body of Christ all around the world in this hour. All around the world, wake your church up. Wake us up, Lord God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Let's worship. Carry that kind 